Yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, last class, if you remember, we uh, covered the book of Genesis. And in the book of Genesis, uh, we looked at the beginning of various uh, concepts, uh, various acts of creation. Um, so we looked at the beginning of the universe itself, uh, the beginning of humans, uh, the creation of, uh, um, of all the plant life and the animal life and all the other forms of life that God has made. Uh, we also went on to look at the fall of man, um, how sin entered the world, and the victory over Satan that was promised right in the book of Genesis. So these are all things which we looked at last class in the book of Genesis. Uh, today, uh, we will briefly look at the book of Exodus. Exodus, as you know, is mainly the story of uh, how God delivered the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. Um, so that is the main focus of Exodus. We see um, uh, the Israelites coming out of Egypt uh, victorious, and we see them finally being set free from their slavery. So now they become a free nation. They have not yet reached the promised land, uh, but uh, now they have been liberated uh, from the control of the uh, Egyptian pharaoh. So. Um, the focus is more on this in uh, the book of Exodus. Now, um, regarding the events which led up to their slavery, we see that at the very end of the book of uh, Genesis, where uh, we are told that uh, Joseph invites his family uh, to Egypt you know, to protect them from the famine. So which is why uh, Joseph's uh, family members uh, come there to Egypt to be with him. And at that point of time, the Pharaoh is favorable towards them. And uh, they are able to enjoy uh, shelter in the region of Goshen in Egypt. But then after the Pharaoh, who is familiar with Joseph and his descendants, after uh, he passes away and you have other rulers coming to the throne, uh, they no longer show favor towards these Israelites. And uh, so they uh, become enslaved. Now, this is not something which takes God by surprise, because the Lord uh, prophesies and tells Abraham about this long before any of this takes place. So right in the book of Genesis chapter uh, 15 itself, we see uh, the Lord informing Abraham that these events will take place. Uh, the Lord tells them, uh, the Lord tells Abraham, that uh, his descendants would be enslaved in Egypt. But uh, the assurance of the Lord gives is that he would one day deliver them. He would one day set them free uh, from their slavery and bring them once again back to the promised land of Canaan. So uh, we see this recorded in Genesis 15, 16, where the Lord says uh, to Abraham, in the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here. For the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. So the promise that the Lord makes to Abraham is that uh, in the fourth generation, after about 400 years of servitude in uh, Egypt, the Lord would personally deliver his people from Egypt and they would come back to the promised land uh, not just as you know refugees who are now returning back home, but rather they would come back as God's instrument to wield punishment against the uh, Canaanites who have rejected the living God again and again, and now whose final time for judgment has arrived. So uh, when the Israelites return back uh, to the promised land, uh, they would return back in strength, they would return back with God's backing. They would return back with a purpose uh, that God has divinely given them, where they would serve as his instrument to punish all those nations uh, which have uh, rejected the living God for the last uh, 400, 500 years. You know? So um, this is the promise that the Lord makes. So an assurance that we can gain from this is that um, even though the Lord foresees, even though he looks into the future and can see the difficulties and trials that we would be facing, 
the promise that we can hold on to is that he would continue to be there with us and in his time deliverance would come so um the lord does not say to abram that he would shield abram's descendants from difficulties and trials he says that they would go through those trials and difficulties but his promise is that he would be with them and he would deliver them so which is why in uh, john 16:33 this is a reminder which jesus gives to his disciples he says to them i have told you these things so that in me you may have peace in this world you will have trouble troubles would be there as long as we are in this world but jesus says take heart i have overcome the world so in the same way even in the um, uh, in the book of genesis we see the lord giving abram this assurance that yes his descendants would face trouble but abram is not to become disheartened he must take heart because uh, the living god who has overcome the world he will make a way for his uh, people just in yeah so uh, coming to the structure of the book of exodus uh, maybe we could actually divide this book into five main portions uh, the first portion would be chapters 1 to 7 um, in uh, verses 1 to 7 uh we see that um there's a discussion about uh, an int- an introduction actually that is given to us about um um moses who moses is uh, about how the people are suffering in slavery in bondage uh, so we see those things recorded in chapters uh, 1 to 7 the second main section of exodus would be chapters 7 to uh, 8 to 13 where you have uh, details of the 10 plagues uh, being given the third important section of exodus uh, would be chapters 14 to 18 where uh, we see uh, how pharaoh finally is forced to allow the people to go and we also see him changing his mind shortly after that and pursuing them however Uh, the lord comes to the rescue of the israelites and the and pharaoh's army is completely destroyed so uh, chapters 14 to 18 would form the third main section of exodus and then uh, we have uh, chapters 19 to 24 uh, where you have moses bringing the people to mount sinai and there uh, the lord meets with the people and gives them his covenant laws he formally enters into a covenant relationship with them and he lays down certain conditions that they must fulfill and uh, if they are faithful he promises that he too will be faithful and he would bless them uh, so these laws uh, are given at in the chapters uh, 19 to 24 and then the last section of exodus that would be chapters 25 to 40 where you have uh, uh, details of some of the laws given uh, there are instructions given on how exactly the tabernacle should be uh, formed uh, the uh, duties of what the uh, you know the, the many duties which the priest would have to fulfill uh, the different um, instructions which the lord wants the people of israel to follow when they are worshiping him uh, at the tabernacle and so you have many uh, details given uh, about how these people are to worship the lord because now they are living in the presence of a very holy god so how are these sinful imperfect uh, humans supposed to um, conduct themselves in the presence of a very very holy god uh, so all of those instructions are uh, given in chapters 25 to 40 so this is the basic structure of the book of exodus um without further delay um, maybe we can actually come into the uh, main highlights which we see in this um, book of exodus um maybe we can start off by looking at exodus chapter um 9 verses 13 to 16 In Exodus chapter 9:13 to 
God tells that he would be uh, that he is sending the plagues upon the Egyptians with a specific purpose. So let's begin by looking at the plagues which God released upon Egypt and his purpose for them. So in Exodus 9, verses 13 to 16, this is what we read, um, especially in verse 14, where the Lord says, I will send the full force of my plagues against you and against your officials and your people. These are the words which the living God is speaking to Pharaoh. He says that he would send the full force of his plagues against Pharaoh and his people. And the Lord says, so you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. The Lord says that he would release these plagues upon the Egyptians so that they would recognize that he is the living God. And then the Lord also goes on to say in verse 16, we are looking at Exodus 9, verse 16. The Lord says um, that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So this, um, these plagues were brought upon the Egyptians so that they would recognize that God is sovereign and that he is all powerful and um, his name would be proclaimed by them and with all the other nations which are watching what the Lord is doing in Egypt. So. How did the Lord do, do this? How did he declare his power? And how did he declare his sovereignty? There are um, five types of plagues which are brought upon the people. And these five types of plagues are actually targeting four categories of Egyptian uh, gods and goddesses. Um, the Egyptians worshipped gods of the water, uh, gods of the land, uh, gods of the air, and also uh, the gods of light, or rather maybe we should say uh, heavenly bodies like the sun, moon, and stars. So they worship these four categories of gods. And the plagues which God brings upon uh, these Egyptian gods and goddesses um, they are specifically you know, targeted in pro to prove that these gods are just man-made and that they don't really exist. Uh, so maybe we could just look at some of the plagues and the religious significance behind them. Uh, if you remember, the very first plague that comes upon uh, the Egyptians is the uh, plague of the Nile River turning into blood. It turns red into color. And uh, why did God choose this particular plague? Why does he begin the plagues with this particular first event? Um, mainly because the Nile waters, the waters of the Nile were regarded as the uh, bloodstream of one of the Egyptian gods named Osiris. So the waters were literally considered his lifeblood. So during the um, um, flood season, you know, when the uh, when the level of the Nile waters would rise, uh, it was the Egyptian myth. It was their belief that uh, Osiris would come back to life. You know, so every year during the time of the flooding of the Nile waters. Um, uh, it was considered very significant by the Egyptian people because they believed that at that, that point, Osiris is coming back to life uh, and his life uh, coursing through his uh, you know, uh, veins. Uh, so that was the belief. So Yahweh, the living God, when he turns these Nile rivers literally into the color red, you know, it's as though he's declaring, if you consider your Nile to be that holy, and you know you uh, honor it and worship it. Uh, then, in that case, you know enjoy the redness of it. So, uh, but but actually, in reality, uh, once the waters turn red, the people are unable to even consume it. You know, rather than uh, uh, this uh, mythical god of Osiris being able to uh, help them with his blood, 
rather you would see over here that due to the plague they are unable to even consume that water on, or in fact use it for cultivation or for any other purposes and they are forced to start digging wells um, all along the shore in the hope of finding um, you know clean water uh, so the lord shows that these uh, water gods that the egyptians have been worshiping are um, um, are just man made and have no power uh, to even uh, put up a fight against the living god because they don't even exist and that is very clearly proved to all the egyptians who are watching uh, what's happening in the same way um, if we were to take another example the second plague the, you know the plague of the frogs um, the egyptians worshiped a goddess named heka uh, who was supposed to be a frog headed goddess uh, you know, uh, she's she had the head of a frog and the body of a human, and that was the uh, mythical goddess which the Egyptians had invented. And um, when all the frogs start piling up in the land, um, Pharaoh literally uh, pleads with Moses uh, to kill the frogs and get rid of them. In a way, you know, it's as though he is saying. You know, we have had enough of this goddess. Please get rid of this, uh, you know, frog goddess because we seem to be having too many frogs in the land. So um, uh, we see God, um, the living God, proving that He is the real God and that uh, worshiping creatures that He has made does not automatically turn them into gods. Um, in the same way, we also see the uh, plague which comes upon the livestock. Uh, that would be the fifth plague. Uh, plague. Um, the Egyptians believed that uh, the, the sun uh, in the sky has healing powers. The rays of the sun bring healing uh, because uh, the sun is supposed to be a god. Uh, and uh, they named this uh, uh, god of the sun, uh, they named it Ra. And uh, the Ra is supposed to have had healing powers and uh, so when when the living god uh, you know brings um, plague upon the livestock it's like as if he the living god has extinguished any healing power which the sun might have so even though the sun is still shining down upon all the cattle uh, the sun uh, is unable to bring any healing to the livestock because the sun is just the created uh, heavenly body which the lord has made um, and in the same way, if you look at the ninth plague, the Lord, in fact, uh, causes three days of darkness to come upon the land. When, when the sun is not even able to shine, uh, because the land is, uh, you know, the land of the Egyptians is encompassed in darkness. Uh, so using these different plagues as signs, um, the Lord points out that he is the living God, that he is sovereign, that he is all powerful. And in fact, as a result of these um, you know, plagues, these miracles which the living God does for his, for the, for his people, um, as a result of that, some of even the Egyptian locals, they too place their uh, faith in the living God. Uh, because when we see in Exodus chapter 12, verses 37 to 38, where it talks about Israelites, you know, the fi finally leaving uh, the Egypt, the land of Egypt, and um, uh, uh, traveling out as a free people. It's, it's explained over there that other people also went along with them. Exodus chapter twelve, verse thirty-eight. It says over there, many other people went up with them. Um, so, the at least some of the people. Uh, who had watched the plagues came to realize that the gods and goddesses that they had been worshipping so far are pure uh, myth and fiction. They don't really exist. And there is only one living God who truly exists. And they choose to follow after him. They choose to uh, go to the promised land along with the uh, Israelite people. Uh, of course, we see uh, some problems also being created by these um, you know egyptians who go along with the israelites in numbers chapter 11 verses 4 to 6 uh, we we read 
the rabble with them began to crave other food and again the israelites started wailing and said if only we had meat to eat um so as long as the living god is performing mighty miracles uh, these um, you know e egyptian locals who have chosen to go along with the israelites are happy but whenever the living god um allows times of struggle and difficulty to come along uh, we see these people very easily falling away from their faith in the living god and so they begin to uh, you know crave for um, uh, meat and due to their instigation uh, even the israelites also start grumbling against the um, manna which you know the lord has been providing them generously and freely from heaven uh, so yes uh some of the egyptians who choose to follow the living god uh probably remain faithful to him and become true followers of yahweh and uh, as the generations go by they must have you know mingled with the israelites and become part of the israelite nation however there were some who were false followers um they did not really love the living god they just thought that he would continue doing miracles for them um and uh, so whenever he took them through difficult times you know they fell away in their faith uh, a learning that we can gain from that uh, is that when we choose to make a commitment to the living god it should not be a conditional one like that where we say lord as long as you bless me i will follow you and when hard times come um, you know my loyalty i would withdraw so that would not that should not be the attitude uh, which we should have um, coming to uh, uh, another um, issue that generally people bring up in uh, with regard to the book of exodus uh, the question which they pose you know they say uh, why did god harden pharaoh's heart and if god hardened pharaoh's heart uh, is it fair to blame the pharaoh um, because he his heart had been hardened by god himself he had no choice in the matter he was forced to be harsh and cruel towards the israelites so he is not really at fault is he so they say shouldn't it shouldn't we place the blame on the living god himself because he says um in the book of exodus that he that he the living god has personally hardened pharaoh's heart so whom should we blame uh, for the you know troubles which the pharaoh brought upon the people should we blame pharaoh uh, or should we blame the living god because the living god claims that he hardened the heart of pharaoh so this is a question you know which many people uh, throw up regarding um, uh, this whole issue of the hardening of pharaoh's heart um, among the archaeological uh, finds you know which uh, have been discovered um, there is one document which archaeologists have found known as the papyrus of ani um it's also known as the book of the dead it's a kind of story which uh, was written during the times of uh, moses by the egyptians it's a very ancient uh, you know uh, papyrus uh, that has been discovered uh, so um in this uh, book of the dead there is a there is an egyptian story told about death and judgment so from this papyrus we gain the understanding uh, of what the egyptians believed in according to their belief system they believed that when a person dies um and you know he goes to face uh, the judgment of the gods and goddesses um his heart is weighed on a weighing scale you know you basically have a weighing scale uh, with two pans right uh, on one side you would place the weights on the other side you would place the product which you are weighing and then uh, you know um, the weighing scale will show you um, uh, how much the product weighs so um, here in this uh, mythology of the egyptians uh, when a person dies his heart is placed on one of the weighing pans on the other weighing pan um a feather would be placed so 
if the person's heart is lighter than the feather then uh, he would be allowed to go to the field of the reeds which was the egyptian version of heaven on the other hand it was if it was found that his heart is heavy with sin and his heart is heavier than the feather then um, you know he would be turned over to um, the goddess amenit who is supposed to be a devourer who would devour and destroy the um, the sinful person so this was their um, mythological understanding of death and judgment so for the egyptians it was very important uh, that their hearts should be light that their hearts should be free from the heaviness of sin and so it is so interesting that when um, you know this uh, account of pharaoh is being written out by moses um, this is the way, wording which is used by moses when he writes about the hardness of pharaoh's heart if we look at the first five plagues uh, in the first five plagues it does not say that the lord hardened pharaoh's heart in fact we see in these verses that it is the pharaoh himself who chooses to harden his heart um he hears the uh, entreaties being made by moses he sees what god is doing he sees what the living god is doing uh, through the plagues he sees proof that this living god is real and in spite of seeing that he personally pharaoh who personally chooses to harden his heart um and this happens in plagues 1 to 5 and also plague number 7 in all of these six plagues um script, scripture records that pharaoh hardens his own heart it is not god who hardens his heart um maybe we can just know, uh, look at one example uh, of the second plague that would be uh, exodus chapter 8 verse 15 where it talks about the plague of the frogs and once the uh, frogs have been you know killed off by the living god uh, it says but when pharaoh saw that there was relief he hardened his heart and did not heed them as the lord had said so the minute pharaoh gets relief from the frogs it says that he hardens his heart it's not god who is hardening his heart it is he himself who hardens his heart but the really remarkable thing is the word which is used over there to talk about how pharaoh hardens his heart the hebrew word that is used over there that's the word kaved um it um, it it literally can be translated translated as to make heavy so if you were to literally translate the hebrew which is being used in those in you know in that verse uh it would basically be saying the pharaoh chose to make his heart heavy in other words he chose to sin against the living god and he chose to make his heart heavy with sin it's a choice which pharaoh made and we see him doing this throughout the first five plagues and also the plague number 7 it is only in four plagues where it is clearly recorded in scripture that it is god who hardened pharaoh's heart plague number 6 and then uh, plagues 8 9 and 10 it's only in these four plagues where it is recorded that god hardened pharaoh's heart maybe we can read out one uh, example that would be exodus uh, chapter 9 verse 12 um where it says but the lord hardened the heart of pharaoh and he did not heed them just as the lord had spoken to moses the word which is used over here the hebrew word for the hardening of the heart uh, that's the word kazak which literally means to to strengthen or to make more tough uh, to make it more strong so here uh, uh, that word is being used that hebrew word is being used to say that the lord hardened the heart of pharaoh Uh, what are the implications of this we see that originally it was the pharaoh who made a conscious choice he made a conscious resolve and resolution 
to harden his own heart and not uh, respond to the miracles that he is seeing in front of his eyes. He is seeing the living God clearly proving one plague after the next that he is the true living God and that these gods which the Egyptians are worshipping are mere mythology, that they're not that they're not even real. And in spite of seeing that, Pharaoh again and again throughout the first five plagues chooses to harden his own heart. In fact, in, in, uh, in, in, on four of those occasions, you know, out of the six times that he hardens his heart, on four of those occasions, uh, that word kaveh is used to say that he made his heart heavy. He chooses to make his heart heavy with sin. Pharaoh, on his own, does that. And so in response to him, all God does is, God strengthens his resolution. You know, his evil resolution to disobey, God just strengthens it. And that is why the word kazak is used. That word which means to make something more tough, to make something even harder, to make something even stronger. So it is the Pharaoh who made a resolution to disobey. And all that God did was to strengthen that wrong resolution which the Pharaoh had taken. And uh, that is basically how we see the Lord you know, operating with many people throughout scripture. It is the people who make a choice either to honor God or to disobey and live in rebellion. And when they continue to make that choice again and again, then the Lord may choose to harden and strengthen their resolution, you know, uh, to continue doing wrong. So based on this, we can clearly see that um, Pharaoh had the free will to make a choice. And he chose to make the wrong choice again and again. And it was only in response to that, because he wanted to live in rebellion, the Lord let him have what he wanted. And the Lord uh, strengthened his resolution, hardened his resolution, made it stronger, tougher, so that he would continue uh, you know, uh, choosing to rebel. But the initial choice during the very first five plagues and also during the seventh plague, uh, it was Pharaoh's own free choice to harden his heart and make it heavy with sin. In fact, on a couple of um, uh, occasions, in, one, in two of the verses, he in fact openly admits that he has sinned against the living God. Um, during the seventh plague, Exodus chapter 9, verse 27, it says, Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron. Uh, this time I have sinned, he said to them. The Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. He actually says that. But then once he gets relief at the end of the seventh plague, he again chooses to you know, uh, rebel against the living God. And we see that, uh, again, uh, the same thing recorded in Exodus 9.34, where it says, when Pharaoh saw that the rain and hail and thunder had stopped, he sinned again. He and his officials kaved their heart. That word over there, hardened their heart, that word is the word kaved, to make heavy. They chose to make their hearts heavy with sin once the hail and the thunder stopped. So um, based on all of these verses, we can clearly say that the free choice made by Pharaoh and his officials was to harden their own hearts, to make their hearts heavy with sin. It's the choice which they chose to make. And all that the Lord did was allow them to have what they wanted. He strengthened, he hardened their resolution and made it more tough. Uh, so uh, we see that. It was not uh, that that Pharaoh was not an innocent bystander, you know, in in what was done to his uh, heart regarding this matter. Yeah, uh, I, I um, I'll just take a short break and get back with you all. Thank you. Yes, another significant um, um, highlight that we can look at uh, from the book of Exodus would be in Exodus chapter 3, 
verses 13 to 16. Now, here in these uh, verses um, 13 to 16 of chapter 3, uh, God is revealing his name to Moses. Um, uh, if you see, uh, if you look at the context, uh, we see that the Lord is directing Moses uh, to go to the Israelites and tell them that the living God wishes to deliver them. And this is what Moses says when God gives him this instruction. Uh, chapter 3. Exodus 3, verses 13 to 16. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. Um, it seems a rather strange conversation, you know, that's going on here between uh, the Lord and Moses. Um, if Moses were to go to the Israelites uh, and say, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, Shouldn't their response be, you know, uh, we are so glad that, you know, the Lord has heard our cry and we are so glad that he has come to save us. Why on earth would they ask, what is his name? I mean, at least they would know the name of the God of their fathers, right? Um, if you were to look at the Egyptian community, they knew the names of all their gods and goddesses. Uh, they knew the gods of their fathers, the goddesses of their fathers. They were aware of the names of these gods and goddesses. So why is it that if Moses comes to his people, to the Israelites, and says to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, why would their response be, what is his name? Um, we get to know uh, the background to this in Joshua chapter 24, verse 14. If we were to you know, turn in our Bibles to Joshua 24, Verse 14, this is what we read over there. It says, um, you know, Joshua is, is speaking to uh, the Israelites in the promised land. And this is what he's saying to them. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. The clear directive that Joshua is giving here to the people is that don't be like your ancestors who are living in Egypt as slaves, because when they were living in slavery, your ancestors were worshipping idols. So do not be like them. Rather, serve the living God and be faithful to him. So from this verse, we discover, we get to know that the Israelites, during their 400 years in uh, Egypt, they completely forgot the God of their fathers. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, you know, uh, who had given them a wonderful covenant promise that they would one day inherit the entire promised land. They had completely forgotten this God. And so, Moses understood that when he goes to the people and says to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, they will not even know whom Moses is referring to. And in fact, they would ask, what is his name? And so here, uh, the Lord replies to Moses and says, tell them, I am who I am. He says uh, in verse 14, chapter 3, verse 14, I am has sent me to you. You know, that is what he is supposed to tell them. And he also clarifies further. God further clarifies and says to Moses, tell them that the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. So they would need to be retaught who the living God is. Their fall has been so low. They have gone down so far that they don't even remember the God of their fathers. And it, uh, and, and it literally take Moses having to teach them who this God is. And so here, God refers to him uh, to himself as I am who I am. This phrase, it refers to two aspects of the character of God. It refers to his infinite nature. Because 
he always is i am is not someone you know uh, who used to be god in the past so he's not just an i was nor is he someone who will gain divinity in the distant future so he's not an i will be he always is i am because nobody ever created this living god he always existed from infinity he always was there creation came into existence one day but long before creation came into existence he already was he always has been he always is so in that sense it the phrase i am refers to his timelessness he has always been in existence there was never a point where he started to exist he always has been and he always will be there is an also another aspect to this uh, phrase which god uses about himself when he says i am who i am in a way he's also saying i can be whoever i want to be you know there are no limitations to who i am i am who i am uh, because when you look at the egyptian gods um the according to the egyptian mythology these gods were very limited for instance if you wanted to uh, you know have good crops it would not do to go and worship the you know the the god of the uh, it would it would not really help for you to go and worship the god of the sky because the god of the sky does not have the power to uh, release the rains and uh, cause the harvest to grow uh, they would have to you know the the egyptians would have to go to the osiris who alone is in charge of agricultural fertility and only he would be able to uh, you know uh, provide you with the rains which you needed uh, for the um, crops to be uh, for the crops to grow in the same way um, if you wanted victory in war it wouldn't really help you to go to the war of death because the war of death deals with uh, judgment uh you know and uh, which comes after death so you would need to go to a specific idol which is supposed to have the power to help you in your battles so the egyptian gods were all limited uh, they could only perform certain functions according to the egyptian mythology on the other hand the true god the living god there are no limitations he says about himself i am who i am he can be absolutely anything that he wishes to be there are no limitations to who he is uh, so uh, this phrase which god uses in the book of exodus to refer to himself it talks about his timelessness how he has always been he has always been i am one constant i am there was never a point where he started existing he always has been there and it also refers to his limitlessness as in he can be whomever whoever he wishes to be he can provide whatever he wishes to provide there are absolutely no limitations to his uh, being uh, so that is the significance of the phrase i am who i am um just to quickly uh, reflect upon another um, thing from the book of exodus um if you remember um uh, in the final plague it is the first born of each egyptian family uh, that is killed you know that is put to death as the plague as the final plague now why did the lord uh, put to death bring judgment upon the first born the first male of each egyptian household uh, that is because the egyptians used to dedicate the first male uh, born child uh, used to dedicate uh, that that baby to their um, pagan egyptian gods so therefore the judgment was brought upon the first born through the nine plagues which came before the living god proved to the egyptians that he is the living god and that the gods which they thought were powerful are just simply man made uh, myths the lord established that he proved that and then in the final judgment he brings judgment literally upon the child that has been dedicated 
and devoted uh, to the you know to the to the worship of these gods and goddesses and then later after the israelites have been set free from the land of uh, egypt god says something to them when he is you know giving them um, the laws the covenant laws through moses if you were to uh, look at numbers chapter 3 verse 13 there the lord openly declares and says all the first born are mine when i struck down all the first born in egypt I set apart for myself every first born in Israel whether human or animal they are to be mine I am the Lord this is a declaration that the Lord makes in the book of numbers and in fact the Lord repeats this on many occasions where he says very firmly because I spared the first born of the Israelites in the land of Egypt now they are mine the implications of this you know if you were to notice uh, would be that when these israelite people were living as slaves in egypt uh, like we saw in joshua you know they were living as idolaters they were in fact worshiping the same egyptian gods and goddesses that the egyptians were worshiping so at that time most probably in the same way that the egyptians were dedicating their first borns to the egyptian gods these israelites also were probably dedicating their first borns to the egyptian gods because they had reached a point where they did not even know the name of the god of their fathers uh, abraham isaac and jacob so now the living god lays his claim upon them and he says no longer will your first born be dedicated to other gods now onwards because you have chosen to enter into a covenant relationship with me now your first born will be dedicated to me you know uh, your first born will become a, a servant of the living god and be dedicated to him for his service alone and then of course later we see uh, the lord clarifying and saying you know you would obviously need your first borns to continue working in the fields to go to battle for all those purposes so instead of taking the first born from each home the lord says i will take one tribe you know uh, so which is why the levites are set apart uh, for god's uh, dedicated service and uh, so the other first borns born into the other tribes would be released to get on with the other uh, human responsibilities such as working in the fields feeding their and providing for their families and so on Okay, so um, so this is the reason that the living God sets apart the firstborn from each uh, Israelite home uh, as his, and then um, later he establishes the custom where Levites, the entire tribe of Levites, would be set apart uh, in exchange for the firstborns in each Israelite home. So these are some of the um, main. things that we see in the book of exodus of course due to time constraints we will not be able to look at so many other details which are there but hopefully this very brief um, overview of exodus has uh, proved helpful to you all thank you